Now for today's program. Jonathan Friedland is a Guardian columnist and the paper's former Washington correspondent. He's the presenter of BBC Radio 4's contemporary history series, The Long View, as well as two podcasts, Politics Weekly America for The Guardian and Unholy alongside Israeli journalist Yonit Levy. He has written nine thrillers, mostly as Sam Bourne, including The Righteous Men, which was a Sunday Times number one bestseller. Jonathan is a past winner of an Orwell Prize for Journalism and the author of 12 books, the latest being The Escape Artist, The Man Who Broke Out of Auschwitz to Warn the World. Joining Jonathan today is Moment contributor Dan Raviv. Dan was a CBS News correspondent in Israel, Europe, and Washington for 40 years, and then senior DC correspondent for Israel's I-24 News. Dan is the author of books about Israeli espionage and diplomacy, including Spies Against Armageddon and Every Spy a Prince. Please welcome Jonathan Friedland and Dan Raviv. Jonathan Friedland, it's great to be with you. You are in London, I believe. Uh, in I'm your, in London, England. Yeah, that's right. In a, in a home office with many, many books. Yes. I mean, many on the shelves and even quite a few, I'm afraid to say, on the floor. The books are taking over the home. So uh, that's why you can see a sort of rising tide of books as if to encircle me. Jonathan, our, our phrase for that is genius at work. So we, we can we can <laughs> clearly see that. Now, in this book, The Escape Artist, uh, it really does relate to the fact that this week we're remembering the Holocaust. In my opinion, we should always remember it. But the United Nations actually set aside uh, this week, January 27th specifically, as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, it is apparently marking the anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp. So, uh, as I said, it's good to remember in any context. Your book, The Escape Artist, is focused uh, mostly on a man a Jew who escaped Auschwitz, which of course is very, very rare. The star of your true story, the escape artist, is a man named Rudolf Verba. He died 17 years ago at the age of 81, a biochemist in Western Canada. And you write that you first became aware of Rudolf Verba and his story by seeing him interviewed in a movie that many people will remember, the nine hour documentary called Shoah, by Claude Lanzmann uh, in 1985. So you saw that in a London cinema movie theater and something about Verba struck a chord with you. Yeah, good to be with you, um, Dan. And thank you for that uh, introduction. And you're quite right. It was a moment uh, in that darkened room in the London uh, Curzon Mayfair cinema. I remember it so well. I went on two consecutive days because the nine-hour film was shown in two parts. A very unusual documentary, as you said, because it had no archive footage. It instead, was only interviews with witnesses in, in full colour, um, people who were around now in the present moment. And looking, watching it, I was 19 years old at the time. I was watching this succession of what looked to me to be very grey, very old, even candidly broken men and women, overwhelmingly men, until suddenly this figure explodes onto the screen. I mean, hugely charismatic, uh, where the others were speaking Russian or German or Polish, he's speaking English, where the others were in Eastern Europe in empty uh, fields and forests. He's there in New York City. Uh, he's wearing a tan leather coat. He has this uh, head of thick, lustrous hair. He looks like Al Pacino in Scarface. You know, he looks like a kind of cool guy in the 1970s Manhattan skyline behind him and I remember thinking well who's this guy you know he was different from everyone else and um he then almost as an aside actually because Landsman is not interested in talking to Rudolf Ferber about this but he mentions that he uh, as a Jew had escaped from Auschwitz aged as it happens 19 the very age I was sitting in the movie theater and I, even though I was only 19, I knew enough then to know that essentially Jews did not escape from Auschwitz. This basically didn't happen. I mean, it turned out to happen a handful of times. And one of the very first was Rudolf Verber. And um, the name stayed with me for life. I mean, for decades have passed, time passed. But in recent years, I found myself thinking again about Rudolf Verber, really for a reason which I'm sure we'll talk about, which is the mission for Rudolf Verber's escape was in order to get the truth 
out to get the truth out from underneath this mountain of lies in Auschwitz and suddenly we were in the era two or three years ago when everyone was talking about post-truth and fake news and lies and misinformation and I found myself going back to the story that I'd seen as a 19 year old the story of Rudolf Erber. Well at the start of your book it's very cinematic which is which is terrific we're, we're with two men together trying to escape from Auschwitz hiding under a pile of wood uh, and right away uh, you show your familiarity with terms that were used in concentration camps the the rank of the officers the word commando for a, a group of prisoners being marched out to work and back to the barracks uh, the way the SS guards would search uh, for escapees using sniffer dogs how did you get that familiarity? I, 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 you, you never interviewed Rudolf Verba. No, I mean, I, I've realized and I have worked out that I would have been once in the same room as Rudolf Verba, uh, which I only discovered as I was going through the papers. But in the late 80s, I was a student at Oxford University. There was a conference in Oxford on the Holocaust. Uh, there was an event addressed by Claude Landsman, which I remember going to. Uh, and Landsman at one point is asked, how did the survivors you interviewed for the film react to being in your film? And he says, well, you don't need to ask me. One of them is here. Uh, and he gestured to the audience. I then was going through Rudolf Verber's papers and I see him saying, dear Claude, I will be in Oxford on these days. I will come to your event. And I realized that was the event and he was the survivor. So he and I were in the same room, but you're right. I never interviewed him. I was extraordinarily lucky. I mean, partly because, uh, as you can see from all these books here, there are incredibly detailed accounts of, of Auschwitz where uh, and I immersed myself in them where your point about the vocabulary and the and the exact setup, the layout, the maps, all of that stuff is there in the archives. But where I was particularly lucky was twofold. First, Rudolf Erber himself uh, had written a memoir. Six, it was published 60 years ago in the early 60s in London uh, when he lived here briefly. So there was that as a key source. He had also been interviewed not just by Landsman, but by two or three other historians and crucially had appeared often as a star witness in court cases, war crimes trials. There was a big trial of a Holocaust denier in Canada around the time that Shoah came out in the mid-1980s, and Rudolf Verber was on the stand for days, and there were hundreds of pages of transcript really going into the granular detail um, of the story, which I was able to plough through. And then the second huge lucky break I got was that I knew that he had been married uh, before there was a first wife. I knew she had lived in England. I tracked her down. She was 93 years old. She was living here, 20 minutes drive from where I'm talking to you. Um, and during that COVID summer of 2020, I sat in her garden uh, interviewing her. And what I didn't know until I was face to face with her is that she wasn't just his first wife. She had also been his teenage sweetheart in the small provincial Slovak town of Ternova. She had been 12 years old. He was 14. Um, she knew the boy before he was in, in uh, Auschwitz and therefore was able to tell me in a way what it, how the change had come about in him that and and just a last piece on this but on our last conversation she told me that her gr young grandson was going to join us because there was something upstairs she wanted to get for me which she was too not strong enough to get herself the boy 25 years old went upstairs he came down with a red suitcase and the two of them almost ceremoniously handed this to me and she said those are Rudy's letters and the suitcase was packed with Rudy's own handwriting, letters to her, to his daughters. And that was the moment, Dan, when I've got to tell you, I thought, OK, I'm meant to write this book. Oh, absolutely. You do make your own luck, but that's very lucky. Um, the old letters, by the way, in Slovak, right? N not Yiddish. Is that right? Well, he spoke I mean, every language. He was extraordinarily gifted. Uh, he's, he certainly spoke uh, Yiddish. He spoke Slovak. He spoke Czech. Um, he spoke uh, some Hungarian. He taught himself some Russian, of course, English later in life. So that, and, and German. All of that would prove very important in his story. Um, the letters, as it happens, were written in English because he was writing chiefly in those letters. These were post-war and they were written to, Go to Goethe, his, his first wife, but also to his daughters who were raised in England. And so he wrote to them in their 
language as they got older, and that was English. So again, very lucky for me. <laughs> yeah, I suppose I'd say that. Though I know you used translators when necessary in a, in a, in a lot of oh, reasons. Oh, yes. No, in terms of the, there were German letters, there were uh, there were interviews in Slovak. I mean, I had two or three people around Europe translating for me um, and acting as interpreters, as guides. When I went to Poland and to Slovakia, there was a sort of team of three or four people, Hungarian. Uh, no, Rudy was a poly glot and uh, it meant i because i'm not it meant i had to assemble a sort of team of people to wade through all these papers and translate them yeah you know what i'm wondering because you mentioned a few minutes ago that a handful of of jewish prisoners did escape from auschwitz over the years um any of them would have had horrendous terrible stories to tell but you're saying that that verba who at the time was named uh, walter rosenberg um uh, you're saying his his mission was to escape and tell the story. It wasn't just to escape and save his own life. Yes, that's right. That's crucial. Um, that he and he escaped with a, an escape partner, Fred Wetzler, for also from the same Slovak town that Goethe and Rudy were from, uh, of Ternova. Uh, they escaped together with this shared mission. By then, they both had. They were slaves in this in the concentration camp out of Auschwitz, as you know, and as people watching this know, Auschwitz had this curious double function. It was simultaneously a death camp with gas chambers and crematoria, where the life expectancy of a Jew was measured in hours. And attached to it was a separate entity in a way, a distinct entity is a better way of putting it, which was a concentration camp, a slave labor camp, where Jews were used for their uh, toil uh, as slaves to build industrial plants, to uh, really staff up what was a kind of profit center for the SS. Um, and that is, uh, they were there and they threw a whole story involving yes random good luck also their own uh sort of wit but crucially there was an auschwitz underground a kind of you know a resistance who through bribery and blackmail were able to get better jobs for for their those people who were uh, aligned with them and so rudy and fred both had jobs actually as bureaucrats as as registrars in the barracks keeping tabs of the numbers of prisoners and those that enabled them to have decent food rations they wore even clothes that were better than regular prisoners in some ways re if they were being purely rational it might have been rational for them to stick it out and 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 to sort of wait it out till the end of the war so they weren't escaping purely to save uh, their own skin instead rudy as one of the jobs he'd had inside auschwitz was on the alter juden ramp the old jew ramp is what the ss called it it was uh, the railway platform that each of those transports that would arrive every day, sometimes five trains or transports a day, uh, would arrive from all points across Europe. He saw the Jews of Europe being uh, falling out of these cattle cars, uh, many of them dying from the uh, star you know, starvation, from the thirst, from the uh, fetid conditions they were in there but then be lined up and submit uh, famously selection that you know people would be sent to the left which meant immediately to the gas chambers and right to be prisoners to be tattooed and marked and used as slave laborers he watched that night after night and he noticed two things first that um the not one person who ever got off one of those transports he would say this in later life not one of them ever had a single clue where they were or what fate awaited them. They were entirely in the dark. And second and related, they would then line up in fairly, or as they were to ordered to do, but in orderly fashion, they would organize themselves as, or be, be organized at gunpoint into columns. And he was struck that they were complying. And he gradually understood that the Nazis' key element in their method industrial method was deception that the jews who arrived on that railway platform were convinced that they were at the beginning of a new life that they had been deported to this place in order to live in a new jewish community in the east they brought with them pots and pans but also children's textbooks and exercise books toys they believed they were going to start a new life and that is because they had been told that 
they had been lied to. And so Rudy very rapidly came to the conclusion that the only way of slowing down this Nazi killing machine was to remove this vital element in it, namely deception, which was to somehow get the Jews of Europe to no longer be behind that veil of ignorance, to tear down that veil of ignorance so they knew what fate awaited them. He wasn't naive, by the way. He didn't think that they would immediately revolt. He didn't think they would take up arms. He looked at the people coming off those trains. They were weak. They were old. They included children. They had no weapons. He knew they wouldn't launch some kind of armed rebellion, but he thought they might panic. There might be a stampede on the railway platform, and that alone would throw some sand in the gears of the Nazi killing machine. And so he decided somebody has to tell the Jews of Europe what it means to be taken to Auschwitz, and that somebody might as well be me. If you've tuned in late to this moment, magazine Zoominar, we're speaking with Jonathan Friedland, uh, joining us from London, the author of The Escape Artist, which, as you're hearing, is about one of the men, one of the Jews who did escape from Auschwitz. By the way, why does uh, why does Rudy merit uh, the name the escape artist in his life, as you describe it? And again, don't give it all away. Uh, so there's so much more in the book, but he didn't just escape from Auschwitz. No, that's quite right. The, the, the title came to me as soon as I found out that his escape from Auschwitz was not his first and would not be his last. That prior to his arrival at Auschwitz, when the deportation order came to Slovakia and everyone else in Turnover turned up at the same at the appointed time on the appointed day to be deported, Rudy just thought, no, there's no way I'm going to do that. This is his words, a stupid instruction. Why would I agree to be kicked out of my own country? I'm I'm a Slovak, I speak Slovak, I'm born here, I'm a citizen. Of course I'm not going to be put on a train and sent somewhere else. And so he made an escape. He was caught, but he then was sent to a transit camp in Slovakia, he, he escaped again. Um, it meant that by the time uh, he got to Auschwitz, still bent on escape, he was, as I put it in the book, a serial escapologist. You know, he was somebody who kept on escaping. And in later life, um, you mentioned that he was he's born Walter Rosenberg. He escaped from his own name. He took a new name. He escaped. He would escape again from Cold War communist Czechoslovakia, he would, in a story that it really could be a book in its own right, a kind of John le Carre style midnight defection from east to west, he kept on escaping. And that's why it seemed to me that he merited to uh, the title, this, this name I've given him, the escape artist. Well, but one thing that a person often cannot escape is one's Jewish identity. One can change one's name, one country, even go to a church. But still, if there are anti-Semites, especially a Nazi regime, they will find you. And I, I thought of that um, when you wrote in your book that as, uh, as a young person, he had a chance in a school in Eastern Slovakia to write what he is. And other people must have written Christian or Protestant, etc. He didn't write Jewish. He wrote Czechoslovak. Um, but I'm just thinking it, it doesn't make a difference. And let me broaden a little bit to ask you this. Because, well, you're a Jewish man, a father who lives in Great Britain. I lived in London from, well, all through the 1980s and a little more. And I was always struck that, well, that the press and I think a lot of English people didn't feel that Jewish people are fully English. I don't know if we're a race, an ethnicity, a different nation. I, you know, I don't know what it is. Are we all of the above? Reflect on that. <laughs> yeah. Um Rudy was very sort of rational uh, about that that question and he you know there's a story in the book when he was in Slovakia you know he was he would become a man of science and he was very rational at the start and he decided he'd been he'd been raised in ultra orthodox Judaism his grandfather was uh, a ultra orthodox Jew and Rudy himself in the early photographs of him he's there with um with tzitzit you know they are slightly tucked into his trousers but those ritual fringes there he decided look if there is a God, I'm going to walk into this Slovak restaurant here and I'm going to order pork. And if there's a God, he will strike me down with a thunderbolt uh, and to bar me from eating pork. So he orders pork for the first time, takes a bite, no thunderbolt. And at that moment, he decides, well, the religion is nonsense to me. It doesn't mean anything. Nevertheless, uh, and, and later on in life, by the way, he would almost never set foot in a synagogue. Um, that didn't interest him. 
nevertheless, he was absolutely avowedly uh, defiantly Jewish, even though, and I know some people have wondered about this because he did take, embrace this new identity as Rudolf Verbo. Perhaps we'll get on to Rudolf Verbo. We can get on to uh, the circumstances in which he took that name. But, uh, he, you know, some people have wondered, did he like it because it wasn't a Jewish name? He always said, actually, that the reason why he wanted to be shot of the name uh, Walter Rosenberg was, for, as far as he was concerned, it was too German. And he wanted no taint of that, as he put it sarcastically, no taint of that highly civilized nation. He didn't want a German name. Um, but he was defiantly Jewish. But yeah, he was, for him, I think he would have said Jews were, you know, a people. Um, and they were defined in some ways uh, by their persecutors. That, As far as the persecutors were concerned, he was a Jew. Um, and it was the Jews of Europe who primarily he wanted to warn when he uh, escaped. You know, his report that he and Fred together would get out of Auschwitz. I haven't told you how they did the escape. It's an extraordinary story how they did it. Um, I'm, uh, you know, we could, I want people to read the book and see how they did it. I think, Dan, you and I may have this in common, people of our vintage um, boys, particularly raised on escape stories from the Second World War. And, you know, the great escape being one of the great movies. I have looked at a lot of escape stories and I can, I, I'm obviously biased, but I think this one is the most thrilling of all of them because of what they had to do. Uh, they did escape uh, they then incredibly had to get their, you know, adventure was not, the danger was not over. They had to get through um, uh, Nazi-occupied Poland, crossing rivers and mountains and marshes uh, 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 and forests to get, the, uh, you know, to Slovakia where they would be debriefed by the tiny remnant Jewish community that was still clinging on there. Um, and they dictated essentially all of the sort of mental the data rather they had stored mentally um or that Fred, rudy in particular had stored observing these transports and that report um would eventually you know find its way uh, across across europe it would reach winston churchill in london franklin roosevelt in washington the pope in rome but for rudy uh, the the key audience was actually the jews of europe themselves it was them who he wanted to warn for exactly the reason I mentioned before, um, which was that uh, he felt that if they at least were informed of where they were going, they might have some chance to avert their fate. If they were ignorant, they had no chance at all. Um, I mentioned all of that really because I think your question is a fascinating one, but I, you know, I see the world partly as through the way he did. And I think he, you know, the question of religion or race or nation, in a way, the religion didn't speak to him but the, the, that they were a people, that they were a group, was indisputable to him because uh, that's what their persecutors, their killers, had determined. And it was they in particular, Jews in particular, a, a deep feeling of fellowship that drove him to say, my fellow Jews deserve to have what I now have, which is the information, the knowledge of what fate awaits us. Well, in a moment, we'll talk about a play you wrote uh, that had a run just a few months ago at a very well-known theater in London. But I want to ask you more broadly, Jonathan, whether the time that you spent on this project, writing The Escape Artist and learning so much about Auschwitz, about, uh, about Nazi-occupied Europe, the suffering of, of Jews and others, six million Jews killed, whether that has made you even more concerned about every sign of anti-Semitism, whether it's obnoxious messages that are scrolled on the walls of schools, even in the United States, or messages dropped into people's mailboxes, or something in, in the press that really looks like it's anti-Semitic, sometimes in the guise of criticizing Israeli policies. Have you become more sensitized because of this project? That's a very interesting question, because I think Dan, both things have happened, which is on the one hand, when you have immersed yourself as sort of deeply as I had to do for this book in anti-Semitism in the form it took in 19, the 1930s and 1940s, you then realize, uh, 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 or rather you gain a sense of perspective. So you think, yeah, what, you know, this uh, uh, unpleasant aside by a politician or that bit of graffiti, horrible, but it's not, you know, the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, 
and it's not Auschwitz, right? So you have a sense of perspective because I think some of our fellow Jews sometimes do lose that where every bad thing that happens, oh my, it's 1938, it's Kristallnacht, you know, and it isn't. And there's, and we need to distinguish between degrees of evil. Um, you know, they're, they're evil, but they there are degrees and scale. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, it's very clear that what happened in uh, in the period I've written about in this book, in The Escape Artist, did not happen overnight. That it began gradually, and it did begin with words and speech and demonization and steady isolation. And it was a long, gradual process. Um, and, you know, what, what's fascinating about the case of Rudolf Verber, I think, a bit, is that in... Um, uh, in, where he was in Slovakia, they weren't under Nazi occupation. Remember, it wasn't. It was not under Germans. This was a country that, kind of, of its own volition, decided it had a fascist government, a pro-Nazi government, a pro-Hitler government. But it wasn't. You know, they were independent. Um, they themselves decided we want to deport our Jews. We want to get rid of them. Uh, it paid the Germans to do it, 500 Reichsmarks per Jew. The Nazis took the money and gave what they called a lifetime guarantee for each Jew they deported, meaning this person will not be coming back. And this was something the Slovaks did themselves, but they did it to go to go to your point. They did it gradually. You know, at F Rudy was in a village in, in Slovakia, Ternova, which I've mentioned, where there was a kind of bulletin board on the village green where people, Jews, every day would go to see what new edict had been passed. And sometimes they would be very apparently small things. You know, no Jew was allowed to own sports equipment. That was suddenly a new edict. No Jew was allowed to have a radio. Uh, obviously, Jews had to wear a yellow star on their coat, exactly six inches in diameter, and so on. It was gradual. And so therefore, in, in uh, to your point, yes, I, there is a kind of vigilance. I am alert to those warning signs, even as I will insist on the distinction between what we see today and what was played out 70 or 80 years ago. It's important we preserve that distinction so that we reserve our, our understanding and our horror for the real thing, which is not always the same as, you know, an unfortunate headline in a newspaper. Well, Jonathan Friedland, perhaps like me, you, you, you get some satisfaction with the fact that in almost every Western society, it's now unacceptable to say something that is obviously anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic, if you will. I'm thinking of Kanye West, for instance, uh, having lost many contracts, a lot of money, some American professional athletes as well, because it is absolutely unacceptable to say those things. That's a bit of satisfaction. Yeah, I mean, there is progress there. Um... But I'm tempted to ask sort of unacceptable to whom? I mean, yes, those big corporate you know, sponsors of, of Kanye West did eventually draw the line. They didn't move straight away. But, you know, there is another world out there, which is, um, you know, where Kanye West and his friend, this Nick Fuentes guy, speak to people online, you know, in a format probably not massively different from this. And they have millions of people who listen to them. Um, you know, this Fuentes guy is deeply chilling. There is, I don't want people to go and look for it because I don't want him to get any kind of audience, but there is a sequence in which he engages in genuine Holocaust denial um, and with a smirk on his face as he's doing it. And there are people who, for whom that is highly acceptable. It's not unacceptable to them. Um, you know, and so I worry about the fact that somebody like him was deemed acceptable to dine at the table of a former president of the United States. That's shocking to me. Um, so, you know, yes, there's there are good signs, but, um, you know, I, there's, no, there's no room for us to sort of kick back and feel complacent. I mean, I just want to mention one other thing, because I think this is also relevant the the book has huge lessons i think and the story of rudolf Weber has very big lessons for us as jews um first first and foremost no doubt but there is also something in there which is a kind of universal thing and that is 
how once that report did get out, how difficult so many people found it uh, to believe that, you know, there were many, many responses to the report there. there I, I put them in the book, you know, anti-Semitic responses uh, to your point that you've been raising, where officials in London and Washington said, you know, we've heard enough from these wailing Jews. We've got to maybe these Jews are exaggerating really unpleasant stuff. Um, there were practical problems. They didn't feel they could do something without, divert, you know, de derailing the war effort. They couldn't really bomb the railway tracks to Auschwitz. That debate was triggered by the report from Werber and Wetzler. But there was also just simple incredulity. And that was something human, where human beings in some ways could not accept what Rudy and Fred were telling them, which is that there was something truly horrendous and truly un um, unprecedented in human history, namely a place in Europe that existed solely for the mass killing of human beings, a killing centre. Um, no such place as Auschwitz-Birkenau had ever existed before in human history. And so when the word got out, you know, for example, to Hungary, which was the last Jewish community in Europe that had not yet been pulled into the Nazi inferno. That was the place Rudy was so determined to get his message. He wanted to warn the Jews of Hungary, look, you're next. And if you get on those trains, you will arrive at a place that has been built for your murder. He wanted that report to be passed to them. The report did get to, them, to the hands of the leaders of that community. And one of those leaders, Samu Stern, read the report and said, how do we know this isn't the product of the fevered imagination of two rash young men. And he and other leaders in, in Budapest, we might get into this, therefore did not pass on the warning that Fred and Rudy had risked everything to get out. Now that I think is a human thing, that we do find it very hard to absorb uh, warnings of our own imminent destruction and I look at our world today and I think human beings are often very resistant to hearing this stuff so yes big lessons for us as Jews to be vigilant in the face of renewed anti-semitism but I also think there's lessons here for, for for the whole world for human beings that actually eat when you're getting tidings that are terrible and bleak you you do have to sometimes believe them even if everything in you wishes to somehow find a reason not to believe there's a lot to think about there. To some people, it would be climate change. To others, it's the existence of massive nuclear arsenals in the hands of, of countries. And will they ever be used? We hope never. We don't want to talk about it. Here's something else that I'd like to talk about, though, and it's your experience um, as a playwright at one particular theater, and I know at the Royal Court Theater in London. Um, I, I would have to say in recent years, it's been a focus of controversy because it seems to me, this is what I understood at least, the Royal Court Theater was very left-wing, oh, isn't everyone in theater, um, and has gone along with actors and playwrights and directors who are very anti-Israel. And usually if you'd ask them, they'd say, I'm not anti-Jewish, I'm not an anti Semite, as they, they say in the UK, but I'm anti-Israel and Israeli policies. And for one reason or another, my impression is the royal court commissioned you to write a play. And, and well, you tell me if I got that right. I know the title was Jews in Their Own Words. Um, it ran, uh, well, just a few months ago. I certainly saw newspaper articles about it in September and October. Is it true? Did the royal court, maybe to clean up its image, ask Jonathan Friedland to please write a play about British Jews? Um, you, you've broadly summarized it. I mean, what happened is that the Royal Court did indeed have this checkered history in terms of its relationship with the Jewish community. It commissioned a play in the 1980s, which was actually touches on the events we've been talking about, about the role of the Hungarian Zionist leadership. The play essentially accused them of colluding out of some ideological sympathy with Nazism. Um, that was a huge controversy. The play never actually was never actually performed. Then um, in 2009, during the uh, war on, in Gaza, uh, the Royal Court staged a very short play called Seven Jewish Children, um, a play for Gaza. And several critics, Jewish critics who saw it, said that the, uh, the, the play... Um, drew on a kind of blood libel lineage in, in its suggestion uh, 
that Jews were somehow uh, either uncaring or even worse, taking some kind of uh, gloating pleasure in the deaths of non-Jewish children. This was the critique of at least two very eminent Jewish critics um, who did say that the play drew on this anti-Semitic imagery and made a big point of saying that the play noticeably uh, was not talking in its focus about, didn't chose as its title, not seven Israeli children or seven Zionist children, but was about Jewish children. It was about what Jewish parents tell their Jewish children and therefore invited the audience to think this was somehow about Jews rather than about Israel. That was the background. Then in um, 2021, uh, the play, the, the theatre, the same theatre, was due to stage a play uh, about a uh, manipulative, uh, predatory billionaire. Who, and in a marketing announcement, they announced that this character was to be called Herschel Fink. And immediately, Jews in Britain said, well, that's a Jewish name. And you've just given a Jewish name to a character who matches all the stereotypes uh, uh, uh anti-semitic stereotypes of jews uh the theater initially was defensive and said no the character is not even jewish etc but over time eventually sort of put up its hands and says look we've made a mistake here uh something has gone wrong here and as part of that process of putting it right they the, the artistic director of the theater did call me and talk to me about what had gone wrong and i have to be honest i really was you know excoriating in my criticisms of the of the decision she had made and that the theater had made and eventually said look the more powerful than any kind of you know putting out a statement is for us to do something uh, with theater and so she invited me as you say to um write a verbatim play it consisted of uh, excerpts of 12 interviews i did with 12 british jews i chose them the theater had no hand in them who would talk about their experience of anti-Semitism, particularly at the hands of liberal or left institutions, the universities, the British Labour Party, the theatre, including the Royal Court. And so included among the, my 12 interviewees were a couple of interviewees who did, yes, point the finger at the Royal Court itself and did talk about the, the, the plays that I have mentioned in fact, the very first words more or less spoken in the play were, you know, Herschel Fink. It was the elephant in the room and it was addressed right, right, right away. I, I think it was an amazing experience. It was amazing for me. I've never written for the stage before. It was an incredible thing to do. Fascinating for me. Um, but it was also really um, wonderful, I think, for British Jews to feel that at last an institution had listened to them and instead of saying, you know, no, you're exaggerating, you're wrong, we're going to give you the floor. And so there were night after night, there was an audience, half non-Jewish perhaps, I, you know, I wasn't counting, but non-Jews and Jews mixing together. And there was something extremely sort of validating about being heard in that particular space. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it because it was, um, it was a very different experience for me, but I think, um, in a way, I think the Royal Court showed that a sort of model of behaviour of how institutions should behave when they are called out for prejudice of any kind. They should, instead of being defensive, they should do, I think, what the Royal Court did, which ended up being a really big learning experience for the theatre and for everyone involved. Well, what I'll call a left-leaning theater. It reached out to a well-known uh, Guardian columnist, that's you, uh, who hosts Radio 4 programs on BBC Radio 4 as well as podcasts. The result was a play. Everyone was talking about it. I think I read in the British newspaper, the JC, the Jewish Chronicle, last October, that while the play was obviously aimed at reducing anti-Semitism and promoting understanding, there was, all, there was some sort of targeting by anti-Semites of the royal court, like... How would you summarize that? The royal yeah, I mean, court got criticized by those anti-Semites. Yeah, I mean, there were people who are, you know, not friendly towards Jews who were resentful that this theater was giving a platform to, you know, they would never say to Jews at all, but they said the wrong kind of Jews, you know. And they did. There were there were some very abusive phone calls to the telephone switchboard. There was horrible stuff on social media. And again, I think the theater... Um, I really felt this was part in some ways. I mean, they they did learn from that. They thought, 
wow, we now uh, have experienced directly everything that you are talking about in this play and that the 12 interviewees, you know, we, there were a range of British Jews on this, their words being acted by actors, voiced by actors, you know, but they were a lawyer and a doctor, but also a uh, social worker and a, you know, house painter and uh, a student. And I, that people saw the full range of the Jewish experience. But one thing that came through loud and clear from these people, all of them, was their lives had in some ways been touched by uh, anti-Semitism. And then suddenly there were people working at the theatre who whose own lives were now being touched by anti-Semitism. And it was a it was a moment where they thought, right, we get we we now sort of get it. We get Jonathan, everything you're talking about. Jonathan, be kind enough to take just a minute or two, because next Suzanne Borden of Moment magazine um, will be uh, asking some of the questions that our viewers are submitting as we do this Zoom in our live on January 24th. Here is that question. It's the role of Israel in all this. There was some criticism of the well-liked filmmaker Ken Burns, who makes amazing documentaries, mostly for public TV in the United States. And the last one, you know, was how America had not allowed Jewish refugees to come in to America during those during the rise of Nazism, and how insensitive American authorities had been. And, and I, I saw Ken Burns asked at a public event, "Well, what about the role of Israel? You've never said." And I think he's often criticizing Israeli policies, though he hasn't made films about it. And so I got the idea he wasn't comfortable, you know, holding up Israel as the potential answer to all this. So here's your chance in a minute or two. Considering there was no Israel at the time of The Escape Artist in 1943, mm -hmm. no Israel till 48. Now Israel mired in controversy. And now the new Netanyahu government and its right wing uh, ministers <laughs> wrap all that up in a minute or two the role of israel is a place where at least we can feel there's a place to go but maybe the controversial policies generate even more criticism of us jewish people mm, yeah well it's deep water this um as you as you say in your question i mean it, it wraps up so many different things i don't think there are many jews who can hand on heart look at look you know gaze into the abyss of the shoah and come out of that not saying that a place, a haven, a refuge was necessary for the Jewish people and is necessary. That certainly for me, the, you know, there was an argument among Jews in pre-war Europe and around the world. Uh, you know, members of my own family were on both sides of that argument. But in all honesty, the Holocaust ended that argument. Uh, even the anti-Zionists in my own family put their hands up after it and said, okay we need a place uh, where Jewish lives are can be defended. And that was, you know, Rudy, well, for example, going back to him, Rudolf Verber, you know, he was scathing about some individual Zionists and people therefore wrongly drew the conclusion, well, he was hostile to Zionism. He wasn't. Um, his, his second wife, Robin Verber, uh, who was a huge and wonderful help for this book, uh, his widow, um and still alive and living in the united states a wonderful source for of memories and stories about rudy verber she said you know rudy supported israel he was rooting for it she said you know he had a very specific beef with a group of politicians who had he felt let him and 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 the jewish people down in in europe uh, by failing to pass on or act on his report but the notion of the necessity of a Jewish homeland after the Holocaust. I think it's very difficult to argue that the that that uh, a dispute was not settled by the fact of the Holocaust. As for its conduct today, that's then a different question. Then, once you're not into the realm of should it exist or should it not exist, it does exist. What kind of country do we want it to be? You know, to my mind, I, it's essential that it be a democracy, and by democracy, I mean a true, a full. Uh, democracy where there are institutions like in the United States that can check and balance the government and the, I you know deplore I've just written about it for the new next column that's going to be in the Jewish Chronicle by me which will appear on Friday uh, deploring this uh, assault on the judiciary in the Supreme Court because I don't know whether people outside Israel realize this but if the Supreme Court doesn't hold back uh, a check on the executive there's nothing else in Israel there is no there's only one chamber it's like there's the house and the you know house of representatives and the president sits in the house of representatives with the majority and that's it there's no senate 
there is no um you know there's no balance between the president and the congress there's just one thing and so netanyahu will have all or, or, or some future prime minister would have total power uh if the supreme court does not have the power to act as a restraint on the prime minister so a really big thing is at stake here uh, i don't think it's an exaggeration those people who say that israel's fighting for its very uh, existence as a genuine democracy. I think that's what's at stake. And that's why 100,000, 130,000 estimated uh, people were on the streets of Tel Aviv at the weekend. I think each one of them is a, is a, is a genuine patriot fighting for uh, the, you know, the Israel that all of us, I think, want to see survive and thrive. In the remaining time, Suzanne Borden, come on in. I'm sure questions have been submitted. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of questions. So thank you both. I'm going to try and um, combine a few questions at a time so see if we can get through more of them. Um, the first question is, was there anything that really surprised you that you just had no idea about during your research? And what kind of an impact did doing all of this research have on you? Well, I'll just take the second one first. I mean, because people have asked me this about the impact it had on me. And I, I, I've said something which about that, which I think you know people might think is sort of glib, but I, I really mean it. Which is, I think it's easier to write about this material than to read it. Um, it which sounds, as I say, it can sound a bit glib and strange. But what I mean is, I was having to go into the heart of darkness, but I did it with a purpose because I was then going to come out again and sort of distill it and write about it for an audience, and therefore that acted as a kind of that enabled me to metabolize the material i was reading to process it it came in but it then went out again and i think it would be harder for people to read the stuff i read if they were just then sitting with it rather than having an outlet for it that's the first thing i would say the second thing that i think was vital and it wasn't planned but I wrote the book mainly during the COVID uh, pandemic in this room that you're seeing me here, which is in my own home. And I would be, you know, in the middle of writing when, when I, one of my kids would get back from school or I would have to, you know, go downstairs and, to, you know, let the dog out or whatever. And I was in the world and in life. And I think if I'd gone off to some log cabin on my own, I think I could have, you know, really, it could have been pretty, de you know, despair could have been the response but I was constantly bumped out of 1942 and 1943 because I had to go and put the washing on or whatever you know and that means you stay in the world and in the world of the living so I think those two things enabled me to do it um the first part of your question was what did I discover I mean uh, you know time is against us but huge amounts uh, and I've been very honored that quite a few people who are pretty knowledgeable about for example Auschwitz have said to me that reading the book has made them realize all kinds of things about Auschwitz specifically they did not know. I mean, I mentioned before the, the underground, the fact that there was a resistance in Auschwitz, the fact there was a permanent bureaucracy, administrative staff, including many Jews who were there all the time, who were, you know, got their own food, wore their own, I mean, got different rations, wore their own clothes in some cases or something like it. A permanent administrative bureaucracy including jews i don't think many people knew that that existed in auschwitz um there were there were and there were details all the time which will be in in the book uh and of course the actual mechanics of this escape which is such an extraordinary adventure story that was new to me until i started doing the research thank you uh, a lot of people have asked about Jan Karski and the fact that Jan Karski, who was Polish, not Jewish, came to the United States and was trying to warn as well. And so how is it even possible that that Verba, who came after Karski, um, saying the same type of things and he was still not believed? Right. Good question. Um, so I talk about Jan Karski, the man who uh, was known as the courier uh, in the book, and it's quite true. He had seen the Warsaw Ghetto. He had seen a uh, one of the lesser known sort of transit um, concentration camps. And he came out to tell the world about that. He was not Jewish. He was kind of Polish aristocrat. He had a meeting with Franklin Roosevelt himself. He met the British Foreign Secretary. But the big difference is that, and he wasn't believed, by the way, uh, in every case, but nobody knew at this point about Auschwitz. That's the unique thing that Verba and Wetzler did was specifically about Auschwitz. So I'm not claiming 
that until they got out in April 1944, no one knew that the Jews were being persecuted. They did. Nobody had any idea at a public opinion level about Auschwitz. I think there's some evidence that people at the highest level, Churchill and, and Roosevelt, were getting fragmentary reports about Auschwitz. But in terms of public opinion, the press, people on the street in America or Britain, nobody knew about it until uh, Verber and Wetzler brought out their report and brought word out into the world, which eventually made it into the press. So that was the unique element. But you're, just to close this out, the point about disbelief is absolutely right. And I describe in the book an amazing moment where Jan Karski sits with Felix Frankfurter, the Jewish uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, and tells him what, he, what he's uh, seen in Poland. And Frankfurter says, I don't believe you. And the man who's brought Karski to Washington then says, no, no, these are this man's credentials. You've got to believe him. Uh, and Frankfurter raises his hand to stop him and says, I didn't say he was lying. I said, I don't believe him. They're different things, meaning I'm unable to believe him. It's too terrible to believe him. And I quote in the book, the French Jewish philosopher Raymond Aron, who said of the Holocaust, I knew, but I didn't believe. And because I didn't believe, I didn't know. This is the, the wall that Rudolf Ferber ran into was information alone is not enough. People have to believe the information. Uh, facts, there are plenty. You have to believe the facts. And that is the thing, the one thing he didn't bargain for when he was plotting that escape was that simply giving people the information might not be enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So bringing it back today, why do you think the world is holding back on acting on the Uyghur genocide with more than one and a half million Uyghurs interned and human rights atrocities to rival most? Why is China not being shunned or at least punished significantly as a result? Yeah, um, I have thought about this. Uh, I wrote a piece actually on this theme, uh, starting with the Uyghurs for the Atlantic, um, about how, you know, I do worry. It chills me, the thought that in 20, 30, 50 years time, there will be people on having discussions like this saying, how did they not know? How did they not act? And then people will say, well, they did know. Look, it was on the front of the New York Times in 2018 or 2017. Uh, but one other barrier besides, or, 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 you know, just to deepen this point about knowledge and belief, having the information is one thing, believing it is a second thing. And then the next layer is believing there's something you can do about it. And there were cases in the Rudy, in Rudy's experience where people did believe what he had written, but couldn't bring themselves to act on it because they felt they were powerless. There were some Jews, for example, inside Auschwitz who knew, it's a long story, which I won't get into now, but they knew they were destined for death. They were unlike the other arrivals. It's the story of the Czech family camp. You can look it up in the book. It's a crucial moment. They knew what was coming but they also knew there was nothing they could do and therefore they sort of made a trick with their mind which is we know it's going to happen but there's nothing we can do therefore we're going to sort of put it out of our minds and i think china is so powerful and nobody wants to go to war with china that in a way we file it away in a different part of our mind you know under sort of impossible and i don't think that's morally defensible so i'm not trying to excuse it i'm just trying to sort of explain our own inaction Thank you. And I'll let folks know that uh, Tom Jelton, uh, a journalist, wrote an article last year for Moment comparing the Uyghur situation and uh, the Holocaust. And I will include that in a follow-up email with all the links that go out. Um, your book, uh, you took uh, a great lengths to make sure that it was true and accurate and that you weren't um, making this into uh, a story. Um, so the question is, there are a lot of books and movies out there that are historical fiction and with the Holocaust as the setting. Uh, is there concern that in the future, as there are no more Holocaust survivors or children of Holocaust survivors, that people will point to these books because they are noted as historical fiction and say, see, the Holocaust did not happen? Uh, profound question. I take a um, very dim view, in a way, of those fiction uh, efforts. Um, I know people will say, look, it takes the story to other people. I really worry about it. And this story uh, was so thrilling uh, and, and full of sort of adventure that I did write it with suspense. And people have said it's a page turner, but uh, 
I was absolutely adamant to myself that it be factual. And so there are pages and pages and pages of, of, of footnotes at the end of the book, uh, which give you the source for every detail. And so, that, you know, uh, if, if there is anything in that book at all, uh, you, there will be a proper documented source for it, including there's a moment where, you know, I say that there was a Rudy could feel a bead of sweat on his back. And people have asked me, well, how could you possibly have known that? That's in there because at a later point in an interview or a letter or in his own memoir, Rudy said at that moment, I felt a bead of sweat on my back. Otherwise, it didn't get in the book. I did not, did not want to give a single inch to those people who would point to uh, the fiction that you're talking about and say, well, therefore the thing didn't happen. And so far, I'm very gratified to say that, you know, no, no, nobody's challenged the accuracy of those sorts of details. It's, it's, and you know, anything, tiny things that were in there, you know, for, for later editions, I have corrected a couple of small things because I didn't want there to be any ambiguity uh, about that. This is a, 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 an intended work of nonfiction. Now, Jonathan, you may face that again if quite deservedly, and generally it's, it's good news, you sold movie or TV streaming rights to the escape artist. Have you? Well, there is, um, that's ongoing, and there are people who are interested, I'm glad to tell you, um, you know, several people interested, and sort of um, a decision on that will come soon. But, you know, I will have to be, you know, hawk-like in my insistence that that, if it happens, and, you know, the many, many of these things uh you know don't ever fully materialize but if it does i will be there on the sort of backs of the people making it to make sure that no liberties are taken the story is powerful enough it does not need embellishment and um people will know about those sort of fictional works and i'm afraid i take quite a dim view of them Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're about to wrap up, but a few people have asked about Rudy Verba's own book, and I believe his wife uh, released it again uh, a few years ago. Um, how different is it from your book? Um, what has her, her reaction been to your book? Um, so uh, it is very, very different. The book is wonderful. Uh, it was published and written in 1963. It's had many titles, so often people are confused because it was originally called I Cannot Forgive. It's also been called I Escaped from Auschwitz. It's been called Conspiracy. It's been published under many titles uh, in many places. Um, it's, a, it's a really well done book. Um, it, it, Rudy was helped in writing it by a British journalist um, called Alan Bestick, who did a really excellent job. So I do, um, you know, commend it. Uh, inevitably, Rudy could only write up to what he then knew. So the book more or less finishes in 1944 with um, the escape and then with, uh, you know, briefing those Slovak Jewish officials for the report. What my book is able to do is, I mean, I would say a lot, but two big things. The first is that I can then carry the story on with what then happened to the report. I think my book is the first time that anybody has reconstructed the journey of the report, which is an amazing escape story in its own right, because it had to be passed hand to hand in secret across borders in resistance uh, activ uh, activists in the underground in Hungary and elsewhere, smuggling this thing against the odds, involving an, a weird cast of characters, you know, an El Salvador diplomat and, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a British journalist in Zurich, all kinds of people got this out. And then the reaction. And many people have said that in a way, they're reading the Auschwitz chapters thinking, how can this story get any more dramatic? The re world's reaction to the report is a huge part of the story in, in my book. And then the other thing, of course, is that, as I say, Rudy's story ends in 1944. The last third of, um, of this book takes you uh, to the post-war life. And Rudy, as, as I said before, would be this serial escape artist how he escaped, how surviving Auschwitz impacted his later life, what it did down the generations in his own family. Again, a lot of people have said the really big emotional impact hits them in those chapters. And inevitably, uh, because Rudy's book was written 60 years ago, there wasn't any of that. I'm glad to say Robin Verber has been extremely warm about the book, um, Rudy's widow, Robin, uh, and uh, has spoken about it very positively. And um, we saw each other in New York a couple of months back and I'm hoping that she and I might even do a few events together in the coming months so um, I think it's been 
uh, look, for me, it's been an incredibly fulfilling chapter in my life. I think probably this is the most important work uh, I've ever done. Possibly I may even ever do. And I think from based on what Robin Verber has told me, it's it's meant a lot to her too. Thank you. And and I will, as, as I said to, to Jonathan, I listened to the book. And if anybody likes listening to audio books, I highly, highly recommend it. It is just jaw dropping and suspenseful. And you do have to remind yourself that you are listening to something that is true, which just then becomes mind blowing. So thank you both, Dan. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I want to remind people to go to our website where you can sign up for next week's program about the Black Jewish relationship and the founding of the NAACP in 1909. I will be sending out a follow up email later this week that will include links to Jonathan's book, which I've also put in the chat today, as well as links to the recording and the Uyghur articles, both that Jonathan mentioned and that Moment Magazine did. Again, thank you both. Thank you all for coming and we'll see everybody next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.